Our last plenary, Inside and Outside Science Advice, aligning politics and publics around evidence, will explore the need for science advice to effectively engage publics as much as policymakers and politicians. Sujata Raman, Director of Research at the Centre for the Public Awareness of Science at the Australian National University, will be moderating the discussion. Our speakers are Gabriela Ramos, Assistant Director General for the Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO, Frédéric Bouchard, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at the University of Montreal, James Wilson, Digital Science Professor of Research Policy at the University of Sheffield and Director of the Research on Research Institute. I now give the floor to Sujata Rahman. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for those introductions. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I have the privilege of joining you today. Uh, that's the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, of the land that's known today as Canberra. Uh, I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, also, given that we are in lockdown at the moment, um, I'm very grateful to the essential workers who make it possible for me to do my own work. Um, so thank you very much to INSA for this opportunity to moderate a conversation on a subject that's a central one for my field, uh, that's the role of the public in science advice. Um, science advice has usually been understood as a matter of getting the best technical evidence to inform government decision making. Um, but I think it's fair to say that so much of what we have heard at the conference so far uh, has already gone way beyond this really narrow understanding um, of both what science advice is uh, and what it should be um, as we look to the sustainable development goals uh, as an anchor for our, uh, for our aspirations. Um, I think many speakers have uh, spoken powerfully about the need to bring in matters of inequality, so not just uh, technical issues uh, into science advice. Uh, others have talked about the role of the social sciences, creative methods like foresight, co-production has come up, um, and just in the last panel on cities, uh, citizen thinking uh, in governance um, was, was raised. Uh, so in this session, we want to take the next step uh, and consider the question of how can we enhance the way in which we actually work with the public uh, or publics uh, in science advice. Uh, working for the public is, of course, part of what uh, science advice is all about uh, in its role as, a, as a part of the pu public service. Um, but I want to stress the width uh, side of things. Um, and I think there are different reasons one can give uh, as to why this is important. Uh, so one is just the social responsibility, um, the fundamental responsibility of science advice, the social contract of science advice. Um, but a second reason that uh, ties very nicely to the, the theme for today uh, on foresight and resilience um, is um, the recognition that we know if we want to build uh, resilience to these intersecting crises that many speakers have already uh, spoken about, we need to transform the, uh, the taken for granted ways in which societies and economies are organized. Um, we need policy change for this, uh, but policy change can't happen uh, without broad support from the people. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity here to overcome the usual way in which the public are uh, often thought about uh, in these kinds of discussions, which is as a problem to be overcome somehow to bring about change. Uh, and instead, we, uh, I think we are in a, in a good position to take seriously the idea of the public as an ally, as a partner uh, in bringing about this uh, societal transformation and policy transformation. Um, so I'll turn to the panelists in a moment to uh, address uh, the topic for the panel. Uh, but just a quick reminder for the audience, uh, please use the conference website uh, to post your questions using uh, the ask function. Um, so I'm first going to turn to uh, Gabriela, Gabriela Ramos, the Assistant Director General, I'm sure, uh, of uh, UNESCO um, for Social and Human Sciences. I'm sure in your role, um, you have uh, a lot to say about this uh, question about um, how can we think about the role of the public um, uh, in, in, this, uh, in these conversations? In what ways can we work with the public um, in science advice? Uh, so over to you, uh, Gabriella. 
Thanks so much, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you, and, and thank you for this introduction, Suharta. Uh, indeed, uh, UNESCO has this mandate uh, to promote uh, science and to promote scientific research, and I think that the, in the era of artificial intelligence, it might sound like outdated, but the reality is that uh, the quality of the advice that uh, institutions and researchers provide to the, to the governments um, uh, deliver better outcomes and therefore uh, the question here is not uh, so much about science it's about how do we ensure that science uh, uh, addresses the challenges and there's no one else better to uh, really put the challenges in front of your, us than the public i think that we should uh, consider that the public of course is there to test and to be the sounding board for whatever solution we are proposing, uh, sound solutions, hopefully based on science, which is not always the case in all the governments, but also to avoid that the top-down uh, approach where you just have all the answers and, and you don't listen to the public. But I will go one step further to something that UNESCO is doing now. Uh, we know that the pandemic has, has been devastated, devastating for women and for youth. Uh, we can come with plenty of solutions based on scientific research, social or human science, natural sciences. Uh, but the reality is that we, we rather go for some co-creation. We call for youth as researchers and we got 6,000 participants in a program where we asked them, what do you think the government should be doing for youth? What should be the priorities? And therefore, I think really to, to get into this deep reflection is super important that we do not consider the public only as a passive note taker of whatever we are producing, but also engaging them on setting the priorities. No wonder they're talking about jobs, they're talking about education, well-being. They're talking about trust, which is a concept that is very difficult to measure, but the youth as researchers are, are looking into that. And then the right to science, because let's remember that there are many governments that are not really uh, allowing for science to inform the policy decisions. So it's, it's a very enriching uh, element in the definitions of the options and also in the definitions of what kind of advice we get and what kind of outcome we're looking for. Thank you. Um, there's so much there that we can follow up on. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to those themes. Um, uh, Frederick, um, I know you are in the audience, so if I can turn to you, um, uh, to um, uh, address your uh, position, to outline your position. I know you've, uh, you've raised some of the challenges um, as well in terms of engaging the public, and perhaps we can get to that in a moment. Um, but uh, if you could sort of say a little bit about what you see as the role of the public in science advice um, and how um, science advice can work with the public, um, that would be great. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, actually, uh, it gets back to a point that has just been made is how important trust is uh, in, in advice, in any advice, right? Even if you ask your neighbor for advice, if you don't trust your neighbor, well, first of all, you're not going to ask. And even if you ask, you're not going to, you know, defer or listen to the advice if there is no trust. So the question of public, uh, government, scientific advice, however it's modulated, you know, in different countries, has to be uh, supremely concerned in trust. And trust is not passive. Uh, and this is why uh, I, I appreciated the previous comment, is that, you know, you cannot ask someone to just believe just because it comes from a source of authority. Uh, and so engaging the public serves many purposes, but around scientific advice and the role of advice in policy making, uh, in you know, working with the public uh, builds the trust that you will need when the going gets rough. Uh, so I will, I will uh, come back in a few minutes to some of the challenges, you know, uh, about trust in scientists. Uh, it's not a gloomy picture, but it's a, you know, a picture we need to be concerned with. Scientists overall are highly trusted in, in society. This is measured in different ways, especially in North America and the United States. So trust is high, but trust in institutions in general, in society, not scientific institutions in particular, but institutions in general, is on the decline or fragile in many instances. 
So if we want to think about how to leverage expertise in the very tough decisions we need to make individually and collectively, uh, you know, working, working with the public, and you know, this is a sentence we use a lot, but it has to be very concrete and sustained. If we don't work with the public in terms of uh, scientific experts, government agencies, working with the public in figuring out you know, either what the problems are or what some of the solutions could be, uh, we will not have the trust relationship that uh, is deeply, deeply needed if we want this advice to be listened to and uh, you know, to be uh, hopefully adopted. But this, th so this is the topic that we will come back to in various guises throughout this discussion. Trust is not a luxury, it's the basic condition of the, uh, of the if, if we want scientific advice to have any, any weight in, uh, in the social contract or in the social discussion. Thank you. Um, and I think that the theme that um, uh, both the speakers so far have raised about the nature of trust um, is a really important one. Trust is not something that can be um, generated overnight. Um, you have to put in place the uh, institutions, the practices over time um, to build trust um, so that you can take appropriate uh, decisions at, at some point in time so that you can even consult or engage with the public. So um, I'm sure we'll come back to um, those issues as well. Um, but James, um, I wanted to uh, pick up on uh, a piece that you uh, wrote for um, uh, Nature um, almost, I think, um, yeah, a decade back now. Uh, this was a piece called the Beyond the Great and the Good uh, for the benefit of the audience. I'm repeating the title. Um, and I know that piece had uh, something to do with the origins of uh, INSA. Um, and one of the points you make in this piece is that, um, so you sort of mentioned, I think almost in passing, um, that civil society and the public can actually help make the advisory system more, uh, more effective. Um, so this is something you wrote about 10, 10 um, years back. Um, maybe can, it, can you sort of reflect on that, put that a, a bit in context? Um, what was the uh, sort of reasoning behind uh, making that argument? And maybe, um, you know, have you had reason to change your mind or um, uh, since in, in the years since then? Thank you. Thank you, Sajata. Thanks uh, for, for, for the chance to be here. Yes, well, it's, it's nice of you to mention that piece. It was uh, uh, something I wrote with Rob Doubleday, as you say, uh, nearly a decade ago now. And it does have a particular link to uh, INSA in that it, uh, alongside the message around publics and civil society, it included uh, as a sort of parting shot the uh, call or recommendation to the international science system that there should be a big international meeting uh, of science advisory bodies to talk about these more meta questions of how we uh, think about scientific advice. And, and that meeting, uh, of course, Peter Gluckman, uh, who had been involved in the Nature article behind the scenes, uh, organised that meeting in Auckland and it became the, the birth of the INSA network. So, uh, yes, but I mean, in terms of, of publics and civil society, I think, you know, for me, if I could indulge me 30 seconds of, of autobiographical reflection, I'd come into um, science policy through a focus on um, democratizing the governance of science and, and particularly lessons that uh, had emerged in Europe through the mid late 90s. I began my career in the, in the environmental movement, um, but lessons that had emerged from uh, you know, GM crops, uh, BSE, the mad cow crisis in, in the UK and associated debates. And so uh, obviously one of the big systemic lessons that we had all uh, learned or had told ourselves that we learned from those crises was the importance of taking seriously uh, engagement with publics, uh, taking seriously the, the values, concerns uh, that publics raise with respect to developments in science and technology um, and sort of moving beyond the rather more um, paternalistic sort of model that, 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 that perhaps uh, uh, been in place previously. Um, and we were very keen when INSA was set up that it should reflect that very important lesson in its design and constitution from the start. Uh, I think it would have been disastrous had INSA been set up or had it become, and I hope, certainly hope it will never become, a sort of trades union for, for chief scientific advisors. Uh, it, it has to be a place where 
uh, processes, institutions, individuals involved in scientific advice can uh, be the subject of uh, constructive critique as well as of uh, support and, and mutual learning, which of course is the bulk of what INSA does. Um, and I think it's been a great strength of the network that through its now seven, eight year history, we have benefited from uh, the involvement of lots of different perspectives and, and you know lots of different civil society groups. I think we've struggled as a network perhaps to reach directly to publics just because of the scale of doing that on an international level and, and Gabriella is better perhaps to reflect on that from the perspective of the UN system. But uh, we have certainly included always a, a strong um, academic link through to civil society debates and, and people like yourself Sujata, like Dan Saravitz who's just been speaking at this meeting, Sheila Jasanoff, Heather Douglas, Roger Pilkey, to name but a few who have been influential thinkers on these questions but also doers and uh, uh, brokers to use Roger's term of these kinds of debates. So I think it's a very important feature, I hope it's something that always remains central to Inks's, uh way of working, way of co constituting itself, if I'm allowed to say that, on what I think is my, the, the day before I stepped down from my period as, as vice chair over, over, over recent years. Thank you. Thanks, thanks uh, James, for those reflections. And um, um, yeah, I wonder, I think it's a nice segue into um, maybe thinking a, a bit uh, harder about some of the challenges of um, uh, sort of creating this direct engagement with uh, with public. So James, I think you talked about how um, uh, you know so far in the in the network it's been possible to uh, bring in sort of ideas um, and insights from people who do research with um, uh, the public or uh, publics. Um, and uh, but one of the things uh, I guess it would be uh, good to think about is um, okay, so where next? Where can we go next? Um, and I know that um, all the speakers have um, sort of, you know, been thinking about um, uh, both the challenges as well as the need um, to engage with public. So um, maybe if we can um, go around and uh, if the speakers can um, can speak to some of the challenges of, you know, how do you do this? Um, how do you do this work of engaging publics? Yeah, well, yeah. In, 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 t in terms of engagement, I, I don't think there is any... Um, uh, uh, magic bullet. I think that uh, what we have now is the possibility of uh, of using these massive means of communications that are just amazing in terms of uh, reproducing uh, your messages for good and for bad, and and some and probably that will also call for for uh, self restraint uh, many times. But let me tell you which which what what is very interesting for the intergovernmental perspective is that our institutions engage with the governments because the governments are our, our, our um, shareholders. Uh, but the reality is that if institutions like UNESCO want to come out with, with solid recommendations on certain topics of the issues that we deal with, uh, we of course have our scientific networks, but we also need to call on consultations and, and regional consultations are really something that for us has always delivered uh, very nice perspectives that are really tailored to the to the conditions, to the mindset, to the culture, to the understanding of the issues of the of the different regions. But at the end, what happens is that you come with a more solid project. Let me let me just mention. I, I just finished with supporting member states uh, negotiating uh, recommendations on the ethics of artificial intelligence. You will not be surprised that it's related to transparency and accountability and the algorithms and the bias and all these things that we care about. But also we included some policy chapters on education, culture and things that UNESCO is related to. But when we went out to, to, to put the document in front of uh, the public, of course we received 50,000 comments, which it requires a lot of work <laughs> just to disentangle what the public is, is really inputting into it. Uh, but at the end, uh, in the conversations, two topics that we had not really introduced as a, as a high in the, in the ranks, uh, AI and the environment, and AI and gender, with very concrete uh, proposals, enriched this recommendation in a way that was a, a super good outcome. 
So I feel it, the, the format might differ because we have an online consultation and that's, that's where we have the thousand comments. But then we have, we have regional uh, webinars, seminars. Uh, at the end, I think that we finish with a much more solid product uh, that, that consider topics that we would have not have included if we didn't have these uh, people. Thank you. Um, and um, uh, Gabriela, you mentioned um, uh, AI there as the context for this um, consultation, which sounds uh, fantastic. I look forward to reading more about it. Um, but I know that's a nice um, link to what, uh, Frederick, you, you had to say about maybe some of the challenges of um, engaging meaningfully um, with publics um, in, in this age of algorithms and AI and so forth. So do you want to say more about that? So the, uh, my, my viewpoint on this comes from two different sides of, you know, my own profession. So I'm uh, a dean of arts and sciences. So within my faculty, I have, you know, philosophers and sociologists, but I also have computer science uh, and math. So, you know, the development of AI is a very, uh, well, it's not just a hot topic. You know, it's, it's keen interest in how to do it correctly both from a technological uh, point of view and a human and social point of view. And, uh, but also, you know, putting this aside, I'm a philosopher of science, so let me maybe bring a slightly uh, a loftier approach to this, or maybe, philo you know, not really good philosophy, but maybe, uh, you know, kind of a philosophical glean on this. And looking at how expertise is received and perceived uh, and I mentioned that scientists are overall highly trusted in society and has been over the last 40 years of, you know, studies on this, where it's the, high, you know, most highly trusted group in society, right? There's no distinction between whether they are universities or government, scientists as a whole. Um, but the concern is that if trust in institutions is weakening in general over the same period, the fact that scientists work with other sectors of society, so they lose part of their relative autonomy, will affect, at some point, the trust in scientists. I'm not saying that scientists should go back, you know, in a, you know, idealized, you know, uh, cave where they're alone by themselves, but I'm just saying that one of the consequences of scientists working with other sectors of society is that if you have polarization, well, you know, you're going to, you're going to think that the scientist is in league with, you know, the party you don't like or the decision you don't like. So post-COVID, this is something that will have to be studied very, very uh, keenly, is how the fact that scientists have played a larger role in decision-making, you know, perceived and real, uh, how does that affect their trust? Because they have lost, you know, maybe in appearances, but the, the perception is that, you know, they may have lost, lost some of their autonomy. So institute, trust in institutions at some point will affect trust in scientists. Coming back to AI in particular, and this is, you know, we won't know this uh, for a while, but anecdotally, our thirst for convenience uh, means that our standards, I'm not talking about how government and institutions or the commission that was discussed previously at UNESCO, I'm talking about in our everyday lives individually, our thirst for convenience, uh, you know, lowers our standards in some sense of what we demand of algorithms versus what we demand of humans. So for human experts, we demand increasing levels of uh, transparency, of accountability, conflicts of interest, you know, for various reasons, we, we have incredibly high demands upon human experts and then, you know, we go to Siri or Google, to Alexa or Google, we ask a question, we get an answer, and just for convenience sake, we accept that answer and we, are, when we base some of our decisions at the individual level, but even uh, higher level, you know, just based on convenience. So one of the main challenge for the next few years is how do we, you know, how do we find ways to marshal AI because we, it has provided incredible, you know, um, insight in a lot of decision making. So how do we marshal AI in both individual and collective decision making, while not devaluating human experts? 
And so uh, in, in the next phases of scientific advice, we need to make sure that uh, humans are always in the picture and that we use AI devices with you know, a uh, higher level of accountability in how the data was shaped, how it's being used, yeah, and so on, in terms of uh, you know, the accountability of AI uh, algorithm, algorithm advice. So just the main challenge to me, and, and this is why I said it, it was philosophical, is how do we make sure that we don't let, let's say, the fragmentation of uh, you know, other social bonds or think polarization or other social and political trends, we can trust in human experts and how do we make sure we don't over rely on unquestioned AI advice uh, based on convenience. We're at this strange inflection point where we're training ourselves at the individual and collective level to be much more skeptical of humans and accept uh, AI. And this puts scientific advice in a very strange position where you know, they need to find ways of, of using the great gifts that this, these technologies provide us in ways that don't weaken trust uh, in humans. It's doable, but we need to be very conscious of the perils of, we know the perils of polar, polarization and how social fabric is weakened. This is a, you know, this is a known uh, problem that we, we're trying to address. But our thirst for convenience is you know, the, uh, the danger that we're not really, I think, grappling with uh, outside of, of specialized uh, you know, discussions like this. But in everyday lives, how do we bring back humans in the picture? Thank you. Um, so there are a couple of things in there that I want to um, invite the other panelists to comment on and respond to some of what you, you have said, uh, Frederick, that um, these challenges of, um, uh, you know, the, the search for uh, reliance on convenience in everyday life and what that means for these more sort of lofty visions of public engagement. Um, but I wonder if I can uh, pick up on a question uh, that came up in the chat, which also connects with what you said about um, uh, the factors that might cause a decline uh, of trust in, in scientists. Um, and that has to do with concerns about independence or lack of independence or um, maybe a close um, relationship with in, uh, institutions. Um, so the question is, yeah, if um, decision makers need to see a public groundswell in order to take action, uh, what role can the research com uh, community play in, in uh, building that groundswell uh, without stepping into an advocate role? Um, or uh, the questioner goes on to say, is it okay for scientists to be advocates? Um, so clearly that sort of connects to um, what you were saying, uh, Frederick. But James, I wonder if I can invite you to comment um, on that question of independence, how do you think about the, the kind of dilemmas, the thorny question of independence and science advice, um, while at the same time, um, you know, considering these issues of, you know, needing to actually take action and bring the public along with us? Yes, I mean, I mean, independence obviously is always an, an ideal that we want our scientific colleagues to, to live up to, but it's, uh, as we also know, as, as certainly as good philosophers and social scientists, it's, it's a very hard uh, state to obtain uh, true independence in that we're all subject to pressures and conflicts and biases of various kinds. Um, for me, more important in a sense is transparency uh, and, and openness and being able in a sense to see clearly the different uh, interests and, and pressures that might be being brought to bear uh, you know, on, on the scientific process and certainly on the scientific advisory process, be those pressures uh, political, uh, institutional, personal, uh, or linked to, you know, direct conflicts of interest in terms of, of industry or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, science advice processes, when they work well, are transparent. And, and when, they, when, when they tend to work less well, they're, they're less transparent. And we've seen plenty of examples of both of these uh, over the past 18 months, uh, in terms of the advisory response to, to, to the pandemic. I mean, in the UK, if I can uh, use a, a, a local example, as it were, in an international meeting, um, there was a huge um, uh, sort of a 
political but also public groundswell of, of disquiet about the uh, lack of openness, the lack of transparency that was uh, uh, apparent around the advisory processes uh, that were in place uh, here in the early stages of the pandemic. Um, uh, particularly the, the, the SAGE group here, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, which initially wasn't publishing its minutes, it wasn't even publishing a list of its members. Uh, and of course, in a situation like this where there was huge weight being placed on the advice coming from that body, that very quickly became untenable. Um, in the absence of transparency, all sorts of uh, speculation and, uh, you know, concern real ungrounded can can swirl around so i think you know transparency is really really important um, and that's really what we should be seeking to uh, achieve recognizing that uh you know this state of of sort of entirely sort of objective uh, value free independence uh, you know is 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 unobtainable as again as people like heather douglas have uh, elaborated on it at, at, at great eloquent length so, so for me, that's really the key. And I think, you know, when we see good advisory structures, they're transparent. Um, of course, transparency is not always easy. It's not always a panacea. It can't always be obtained. Uh, and, and we need to be constantly vigilant and monitoring that. And in that sense, the wider public, uh, wider publics and the media and social media and everything else can also perform a very valuable function in keeping people uh, you know, holding people to account, keeping them on their toes. I mean, there are bad sides of that as well, of course, in terms of the capacity of modern social media in particular to, uh, you know, let a, 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 a rumour spread around before you, you know, before it's, it's got its boots on or whatever the, 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 the saying goes. But uh, I think that's outweighed by the very positive dimensions that we see all the time in, in science and in science policy or science society type discussions where, essentially that bigger, more unregulated, unruly, often uninvited uh, global conversation actually uh, is a very effective means of, of demanding and requiring uh, our scientific uh, leaders and scientific advisors to, to be fully accountable. Thank you. Um, Gabriella, um, do you see a conflict between um... Uh, sort of science advisors, um, you know, building support, public support, and, and so forth, and um, and the kind of need for um, independence um, and that sort of thing. Do you do you have any comments on that? Well, I think that that I, I would say that life is more complex than that. <laughs> I, I would say that uh, that uh, the reality is that uh, how do we ensure that the outcomes of the scientific advice through the policy decision that it triggers delivers for people. <laughs> and the problem is that uh, even though uh, the scientific community, as, as, as was uh, mentioned uh, by Frederick, um, is, is trusted uh, above uh, some other groups, the reality is that it also depends on who you are talking to or who are you talking about. Uh, you remember in 2008, we all talk about the end of the economic advice because we were always uh, uh, developing models that were not representing reality. Uh, we were over relying on, on, on uh, market-based solutions uh, for the financial sector um, and thinking that because we just spread the risk among different owners, it would not hunt us back. Well, it did. Uh, and therefore, the fact is that we need to, to, to understand that each one has a role. The role of taking decisions is not for the scientist. The scientists need to present the options and need to really understand and try to be super honest because they might not have all the answers. And that's, that's also very important because they need to look at the downsides of their proposals uh, for the policy makers. But more than anything, if we really want to keep this trust and, the, and if we really want to ensure and, and uh, what, what James by, was saying, the, the transparency and the accountability, uh, it, it's, 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 it's elemental that we get the narrative right and the story right. And that's why uh, in my previous uh, incarnation in the, in the OECD, I launched the new approaches to economic challenges because I was saying, we do not understand the markets. We don't understand her behavior. We don't understand agent-based modeling. And so we need to use new techniques. And therefore, 
for me, the scientist is not whether they produce advice for the governments, is how solid that advice is and how much it will really respond to the needs of people. That's what is gonna get us out of where we are now. Uh, because we have seen that the resilience of the health systems, the resilience of the of the social systems is, is really fragile. And, and in a way, all these complex systems that we need to understand how they interact together and how they produce different outcomes for different groups uh, need better explanation. And that's why I think uh, uh, scientists really need to get into um, developing advice that it, it, it leads to good uh, policy making. So in a, in a sense, the urgency of some of the, the crises that we're facing, maybe um, the answer lies in that, uh, in terms of, you know, whether or not um, science advisors should um, or should not be, um, uh, should not have to worry about being independent. Um, I wanted to pick up on another question um, coming through the chat, which I think um, also connects with uh, what, uh, Frederick, you were saying. Um, if part of the challenges here are to do with, um, uh, you know, the fact that, yeah, maybe the public uh, in our everyday life and, you know, maybe, you know, we should include ourselves in, in, the, in the public, um, right? So in everyday life, there's a kind of search for convenience. Um, um, and uh, so there's a kind of responsibility, perhaps, on institutions um, to do certain uh, certain tasks or, you know, to uh, perform some of these functions. So the question that uh, has come up is, um, what recommendations might there be for universities um, as uh, a, a, you know big institution? Um, what recommendations might there be for universities to um, to be able to um, sort of better uh, operationalize um, uh, issues to do with you know what what um, what we can address as researchers as scientists? Uh, so in other words, create the incentives. Um, uh, to put some of what we're talking about in, into practice, to put some of the kind of aspirations for science advice um, into practice. Uh, so any any recommendations for universities? Um, and if I can ask each one to take maybe about one minute, no more than a minute uh, on that question. Um, uh, any Anyone wants to start, jump in on that recommendations for universities? Uh, Frederick, do you want to, yeah, go well, ahead. I'll be, I'll be uh, I'll be prudent about incentives because this is a type of thing that could haunt me back when I get back to work. But basically, it gets back to the question of advocacy that you you highlighted earlier. Is that we need to send the signal to our scientists, and this includes the students, right? There there are the next generation of scientists, but they're actually already scientists participating to the research effort. That you know, there it's they don't have to be advocate, but they don't have to. Uh, hide their advocacy, right? So there, this get, it's a question of transparency about motives and interests. And I think this is what universities can do, you know, with both students uh, and, uh, you know, professors and other researchers is saying, you don't have to be advocates. You don't have to be a very, have a very firm opinion, right? Uh, that about, you know, a social topic, but it's okay if you have that too. And so if, if we make it, if, if it's less an issue, then it's easier to be transparent about motives and interests. And this means that whatever we provide in terms of advice can be assessed at its face value, you know, as much as humanly possible. So transparency about motives and interests, not to fall into a gotcha or, you know, policing, you know, that's another issue, but just in terms of we need to understand where you're coming from uh, in order to uh, accept your advice. And quickly, the other thing that universities can do, and this is more complicated, but it's with government, is to make sure it's always clear that scientists are not the one deciding. Uh, and this point was made uh, a few minutes ago, is we need transparency about who decides ultimately, and uh, we need to make sure we don't fall in the trap, either universities or government, or journalists to, you know, give the impression that scientists are the one deciding because they're not, you know, elected officials are the one making decisions based on the scenarios, as was pointed out earlier, that, you know, scientists from universities or within government provide. So transparency about motives and interests, you know, this we need to communicate better to the whole community. 
uh, that it's good for them and that we don't prejudge how they should land on this. And also transparency in the broader context about who ultimately chooses and decides where we're going. And it, it's not scientists. It's elected officials or uh, government agencies. If we do that, you know, we have a better footing to, to build and maintain trust relationships. Thank you. Um, so can I ask Gabriella or James, if you want to jump in on that question about universities, any recommendations for universities before we go into a final wrap up? Sure, I, I'm happy to offer a thought. I mean, I think, you know, universities are, are ideally placed to be uh, at the, the front line in a constructive sense of the process of public engagement. And of course, for many universities, this is very much part of their history and heritage and, and DNA. I mean, I, I, I work at the University of Sheffield, uh, you know, in the north of England, which was uh, set up at the start of the 20th century through uh, workers in the, in the steel factories and, and you know, other uh, industrial plants of, of this city giving a penny each to the creation of, of the university. I mean, it, it raised about 15 million pounds in today's money uh, and set the thing up because why? Because they wanted to, to create educational opportunities for their kids uh, in that city. They saw very directly the relationship between uh, support and investment in higher education and uh, both a better city and a better future for their own, uh, for their own children. The problem, of course, in, in, in the modern era is that so much of the incentive structure in our university system has become decoupled from uh, that local need uh, uh, and, and local priorities. And, and that's where the real policy challenge lies, in that I think there are lots of universities who would like to either return to or continue doing uh, more of that kind of activity. I often speak to university leaders in uh you know developing and emerging economies where you know they're, they're, they're doing this as the primary focus but they're being pulled at the same time by league tables and other things to, to focus on on a very different set of priorities so i you know that's where the the, the policy challenge is it's in it's in all of the debates around uh, incentives and measures and uh, the dreaded world of, of university rankings and these things that pull universities away from doing what they're actually ideally set up to do which is to be part of the warp and weft of their local communities uh, yeah. to be part of some other big global game. And, and, and Thank you. Uh, Gabriela, yeah. Yeah, you, you know, I, I, I really think that uh, this, I mean, we, we, we did not uh, uh, got together before to agree, but I'm agreeing a lot with what my colleagues are saying. The, the fact is that I would say for universities, keep on investing in science, keep on investing on scientific research, Keep on bringing more youngsters into these disciplines because we need them. I feel the level of complexity and uncertainty of the of the world economy, of the society, of climate, of all these trends need the best science. But we cannot deny that humans come with values, come with their own ethics, come with certain mindsets, with certain culture. And yes, we all know we need to control for that, but we will never be detached from that. So I would say that if you have students that are producing research that is going to produce fantastic outcomes, let's just go for it. And if they look like advocates or if they look like, uh, let's just let's just do it. Uh, I have been in the in the world in which you produce uh, some facts to show how much an economy lose out of uh, a monopoly, and then the legislators just take it from them and. Uh, if, if you produce uh, outcomes related to climate or to the inequalities that that got just so massively badly uh, for the for the impact of COVID, I think that we should go for that uh, and produce useful knowledge. I know that basic science is is uh, uh, core, and we need to continue investing in basic science, even if we don't know what the purpose will be. Uh, but purpose-led scientific research is also being called. Uh, by the current circumstances and to change the outcomes. Thank you. Um, I think that li links very nicely with a, a, a comment that was put in the chat, which I'm, I'm going to treat it as a comment rather than a question, which is that actually if scientists, science advisors are not seen as more forceful with governments when it comes to sort of key issues like um, climate change, um, uh, the impact of COVID, uh, economic impact and so forth, then actually 
um, that could be a situation in which they lose um, their legitimacy and their sense of independence. So I think it's a very important point. Uh, so just in, uh, in conclusion, um, can I invite everybody um, uh, to go and turn just one sentence, if you can, on any final recommendations for INSA or on this question of uh, public engagement and public trust? Just one question, well, one sentence, sorry. Um, who wants to go first? I, I would say that is the it's uh, engaging with the public is is the bulletproof that that the scientific research or the scientific advice is useful is impactful and that would lead to better outcomes as I said because is the outcomes that we need to redress in the current context. Thank you, Frederick. Any yeah. a last well, sentence? Yeah, uh, we need to make sure that uh, the transparency we expect of humans we demand of algorithms and that we don't hold humans to higher standards than we do our phones just for convenience sake. Thank you. And James? Yes, I think, I mean, INSA is uh, a growing network, but still a small network. I think its role is still going to be primarily um, reminding and enabling science advisory systems and institutions and individuals of the importance of listening and getting down alongside uh, the public publics however they are they're constituted we've got so much wealth of insight into the importance of really listening really engaging in a meaningful way not only in the scientific arena but in many other arenas now of social and economic life um, and we just need to be constantly remaking that point and enabling supporting uh, uh, building the capacity of institutions to do this meaningfully in their own context uh, because it's absolutely important for all the reasons that uh, Gabriella and Frederick and others have said. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, fascinating conversation. There's so much more to be said on this question of uh, science advice and public engagement. I know that there's going to be a lot more about this uh, tomorrow on, on day three um, uh, 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 on the on these questions. So I encourage uh, everyone to, uh, to join. Um, I think what we have shown is that there isn't just sort of one uh, magic bullet for this issue of public engagement. There are maybe different ways in which institutions, science advisors, networks like INSA uh, can um, work with publics um, and take their, their role seriously um, in this job of um, rebuilding societies, rebuilding economies after COVID, but also in anticipation of, um, you know, even severe, even more severe climate change. Um, so if I can ask um, the audience there to uh, join me in thanking all the panelists, um, thank you very much. Thanks also to uh, Christiane um, uh, and to Grant uh, Mills for um, doing so much uh, behind the scenes on, on this. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. Frederick, thank you. Gabriella Bye. and James. Thank you to the speakers, to the listeners. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Throughout the day, panelists have examined the many ways that science advice can better equip societies to face collective changes. Join us tomorrow as we tackle the issues of evidence in democracy and the challenges for science advice in maintaining trust and legitimacy in a fast-changing world. See you then.